Welcome back, everybody. This is Days of Noah number 36, and I quickly want to review the last chapter. We were discussing uh, the account that Stephen gives in Acts number 7, where he's revisiting and recollecting about the years when uh, the Israelites are taken out of Egypt, and they're brought through the desert, and they make it to Mount Sinai, and while Moses is up on the hill receiving the Ten Commandments, they go into idolatry. What I think is fascinating about this account is when you when you read the original Exodus account, we're told that they gather up all of the earrings and the nose rings and all the gold rings that all the people had, and that Aaron builds a cast and he makes this golden calf. However, what we're not told is, is that they're worshiping the hosts of heaven and they're worshiping the stars in the sky. And it's interesting that later in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we receive those extra details through the account of Stephen. And what makes that fascinating is, is that this is how the Bible works. It's this, it's this progressive revelation over the, over the course of mankind and time. And what also makes it interesting is that um, most of the questions that you have regarding Scripture you can often answer somewhere else in Scripture. So, even though the Bible is a large, vast book, it's really 66 books, you know, written by over 40 different authors over thousands of years. And a lot of times, one book and one author will give clues and answers to questions that you may have regarding another timeline and this is a perfect example of that so they made a calf in those days and they offered sacrifice to the idol and they rejoiced in the works of their hands then god turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven that means the stars it is written in the book of the prophets o house of israel have you offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the desert I think this answers our question with regards to what they were offering. It says up here that they offered sacrifice to idols. You know, in the past, I have theorized that it's possible that they did child sacrifice at this point. But when you look closely at the text, I think it's they slayed beasts. So they were probably just doing animal sacrifice, burning incense, things like that. We do see later, as we'll review here in Psalm 106, that eventually they do turn the way of the pagan Canaanites and they start passing their sons and daughters through the fire. And that's what these pictures down here display. You see this iconography here where Baal and Moloch are always represented by this minotaur hybrid, you know, half bull, half human. And the bull goes back as bull worship goes back as far as we can remember going back to Babylon. And I'm sure that it goes across the flood and the bull probably had a lot to do with the fallen angels. They're the ones who were crossbreeding men with animals and making minotaurs and centaurs and everything else. Uh, and then also we learned on the last lecture that at some point the child sacrifice was used through this mechanism here, the brazen bull. This is where they would, the smiths or the seed of the serpent would take their metalworking skills and they would make large casts of iron and gold of, of a bull and then they put a trap door on it and they would put their victims in there and slowly cook them to death. And so continuing on, verse 43, Yeah, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rimphan, figures which you made to worship. Now the tabernacle of Moloch, the tabernacle is a tent. So, and Moloch means king. So they were putting up a tabernacle, tabernacle to their king and the star of your god Rimphan. When we look up Rimphan in the Hebrew, that word is in reference to the planet Saturn. So they were worshiping Saturn. Saturn was one of the seven uh, planets, including the sun and the moon, that could be seen in the sky during that time. They could not see Neptune, Uranus, Pla uh, Pluto, etc., but they could see Saturn. And then lastly, I think it's interesting here, uh, he says, I will carry you away beyond Babylon. And that's kind of a vague verse, but I, I got to thinking that that's probably a prophecy of the future destruction of Israel. That God is already seeing here in at Mount Sinai before they even have set up 
you know, their throne in, in, in dominion in Israel. He's seeing that they're going to go into idolatry because they are an idolatrous type of people. And one day he's going to allow Nebuchadnezzar to come in and destroy them and the temple and carry them away to Babylon for the 70 years of captivity. So this could be a, uh, an early prophecy of that event. Now we have a second witness here in Amos, and he corroborates this story. He says, uh, but you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Kuhn, your images, the star of your God, which you made to yourselves. The word Kuhn means raising a pillar. So we know that pillars were very prominent back then. Some people called them obelisks. Well, the Egyptians called them obelisks. They were in reference to the male phallus of Baal and Moloch. And so uh, at some point throughout this process, they were building altars. They were building pillars. They were building, uh, making bulls. And I believe they were also crafting and making the six-pointed star, which represented uh, the planet Saturn. When you look this word up, by the way, it, it draws a close connection to Saturn. Now we know that the Israelites did, uh, it says here in Psalm 106, that they did not destroy the people that the Lord commanded them to do, but rather they mingled with the nations and served their idols and were ensnared by them. And they sacrificed to demons, their own sons and daughters, shedding innocent blood. So... Uh, it's 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 certain that they fell into this this whole paganistic astrological worship. From there, we went into the details of the hexagram, and the most interesting thing about it is that it functions as a mathematical, geometric, and symbolic representation of a six six six. Now, that has to mean something, guys. It just has to. Uh, you know, that's an obvious very important number in the scripture it connects back to king solomon we'll look at that in a second but we have to take into consideration that this star has a 666 connection and we can see a, a picture of it down here in the bottom left uh, the star of Remphan, which we've confirmed was in reference to saturn history reveals that it did become symbolized by the hexagram we know that because throughout the entire Dark Ages, all the way up through the Renaissance, the ceremonial and occult magicians were using the talisman of Saturn to perform their rituals. Here's an image of it. Notice what you see. On the back side is a six-pointed star. It has a bull with horns in the middle. It's got the representation of the seven planets. These are the sigils of the seven planets. And so... When you put that in context with what we just read, that the Israelites learned how to do Saturn worship from the Egyptians, it involved a bull, it involved the star of Saturn, and here we're seeing the talisman of Saturn. So make no mistake, these things are connected. And what we know about the talisman of Saturn is that back in medieval times, it would feature symbols in relation to the planets. And this is what they use for divination, alchemy, and astrology. Now, in 922 BC, Solomon married the daughter of Pharaoh. And this is really kind of the beginning of the end for him. He got involved with Egyptian idol worship. He started doing magic and witchcraft. It was the Egyptians and the Canaanites who were using the six-pointed star in all of their idolatry. And so, naturally, Solomon adopted that symbol it says in the text that he began to build altars to Ashtoreth and Moloch. The word Ashtoreth is, she's the female goddess of Baal and Moloch. That word means star. Like Astro means star. Ashtoreth, that means star. He was building altars to the stars, to the planets. And he adopted the six-pointed star. It became the chief symbol at that time of witchcraft. And it became the chief symbol of human sacrifice because all of these Canaanite civilizations were doing child sacrifice at that time. That's how they honored the gods of the planets. And we know that shortly after this time, Israel began to indulge in child sacrifice. So we can be sure that Solomon brought that idolatry into the country. And this is where we see 
the name, the seal of Solomon, emerge. Once he adopts the six-pointed star, it becomes the seal of Solomon. There's even evidence to suggest that he had a ring fashioned, and it had a six-pointed star on the front of it, and that became his signet ring that he would sign all of his documents with. So it became a very prominent symbol of that era. Now connect that to the fact that Scripture tells us that 666 talents of gold was sent to Solomon every month by the king of Tyre. And that's a very odd thing to be told in the Old Testament, in the middle of nowhere. When you read in the book of Kings, you know, it's just a very vague, matter of fact statement that Solomon was getting 666 talents of gold. Not 660, not 680, 666. That's a clue by the writer of that book connecting us to the book of Revelations. So, and, and then take that even further when you study Ezekiel 28 and it reveals to you that the one in charge of that entire event was the, the fallen cherubim who covers. You know, the one who is the master worker of merchandise. The one who was on the mountain of God. You begin to realize that, yes, King Tyre was responsible for luring David and Solomon into idol worship. But King Tyre was being governed by something far more powerful than him. And so when you connect these dots, you begin to see you know, what's going on here. Now, Solomon essentially becomes the one who lays down the foundations of what's referred to as the craft. And that later becomes known as Freemasonry. And you know what's interesting is witchcraft is also uh, referred to as the craft in occult circles. So I would I would definitely say that witchcraft and the Masonic craft are very closely connected. From there, we revealed in the last lecture that oddly enough, there is a hexagon hurricane storm that's sitting at the northern pole of Saturn. And that when you use sacred geometry, the hexagon can form a hexagram and it can form a cube, as demonstrated down here. Here's an image where it forms a cube, and here's an image where it forms a cube. And this becomes very important, important to the occultists of the world, because they use uh, this astrology that's connected to Saturn to do all their rituals. And then the other interesting thing is that back in the early times, the god of Saturn was equated with the Carthaginian god Baal Hammon. And at one point in the past, we also connected the Carthaginian god Baal Hammon with the god Hercules, or as the um, ancient Indians called him, Harry Culus, this race of godmen. And so you begin to see that it's all woven together. Um, at, at that point, they were doing child sacrifice on Saturday, which was originally Saturn's day. So on the, on the day that we know Saturday, that's the day that they would do sacrifice to the god of Saturn. And I believe that this was probably a counterfeit um, Sabbath, if you will. Because the Hebrews, of course, had their original Sabbath given to them by God, going all the way back to Genesis, really, where God rested on the seventh day and made it, made it a Sabbath day of rest for mankind. And we know that Satan is a great counterfeiter. And so somewhere down the line, Satan instituted their own Sabbath, which is Saturn's day. And that's the day that they would sacrifice children to the gods. And I believe that was a counterfeit to the, the true Sabbath. From there, we made some very interesting connections with the Islamic faith. We discussed the Kaaba, which derives from the word cube. As we see here, this word derives from the word cube. And as you can see in the bottom left, it's a black cube. Now, remember, a black cube and, and a hexagon are the same thing. Remember, here was a hexagon, and it formed a cube. So the reverse is true, too. A cube makes a hexagon. 
So we're still dealing with the, the six-pointed polygon. It's interesting that the, uh, the, the Muslims believe that it was a meteorite that came down from heaven. And in the occult world, they even go as far as to say that it came from Saturn. And so it's a piece of space rock, which makes that interesting. And they placed it in Mecca in Saudi Arabia, which is the most um, holiest place on earth for the Muslims. And this is where they pray to every day. And this is where they send their spiritual energy towards this rock. And uh, once a year they go on the Hajj. This, this word here, that's an annual pilgrimage where they travel around the Kaaba stone seven times. And in doing so, they travel around it in a counterclockwise direction to worship Allah. Now that is fascinating especially considering that the storm on the northern point of Saturn is traveling in a counterclockwise direction, as you can see here in the bottom left. And so there's clearly a connection here. Um, I believe that it is, a, it is a, an occult ritual where they are uh, channeling and drawing down those powers from Saturn. And what gets even more interesting is that from the Kabbalistic perspective, the Talmudic Jews, not the Torah-worshipping Jews, but the Talmudic Jews who worship the Babylonian Talmud, um, they claim that they wear the Teflon on their foreheads. That's this thing here in bottom center. It's a black cube. They place it over their pineal gland, uh, which all of the Kabbalists are really deeply immersed into the third eye and transcendental meditation. And... They say that they place it over their forehead with the Shema prayer, which is a formula arranged with Hebrew letters in a series of charged yantras, which is an Eastern mystical principle. And then they'll go to places like the Wailing Wall, which is a very, you know, spiritual place, and they'll begin to speak gibberish. And kind of uh, get themselves, you know, they'll, they'll begin to say a mantra. We've discussed these in the past. There's different ways to do a mantra. But a mantra is where you just repeat something over and over and over and over and over until you get yourself almost into a mindless state. It's a, it's a, it's a process of, of opening up yourself to the outside world. Um, and so, you know, when you combine all these things of the location that they're at, that they're using a six-pointed uh, cube on their head, that it's on their on their pineal gland, that it's got yantras written inside of it. They're reciting a mantra. Sometimes if you watch them, they move their head back and forth where they kind of uh, hit their head in the wall and they get themselves into this rhythmic movement. And so what they claim is that it helps them tie into the energy matrix. And that's exactly what it's doing. It's, in other words, it's charged. It's it's a spiritually charged ritual that they're doing. Now the question is is what spirit? Because of course we're going to say well they're Jews so it must be, you know, Yahweh or Yahuwah from the Old Testament. But I'm not so sure of that. Um you know, and they they claim that the cube is built to the dimension of 6, which is the number of binding or bringing down the astral energies into the material realm. And that this Teflon cube acts like an antenna that draws down on powerful spiritual forces from the higher seven dimensions. I would subscribe that these powerful spiritual forces are not of an altruistic purpose, but rather um, they are demonic in origin. Now, the, the other interesting thing is that some of the Kabbalistic uh, rabbis say that the Teflon cube, the six-pointed cube that they wear on their forehead, is connected to the Kaaba stone. They, they admit that this here in Judaism is connected to this in Islam. And what are the odds that we'd see two black cubes in these two Abrahamic faiths? It's, it's just, it stands to reason that they're connected, and the Kabbalistic Jews admit that they're connected. They, they go on to say that the word Kaaba, which is in reference to the stone, where they worship Allah, if you put those two words together, makes 
Kabbalah. And when you study the Kabbalah, there's a lot of different stories about its history, but the majority of them all agree that it started mostly in the Arabic nations and then later was picked up by Judaism. I don't know if that's true, but that's a very interesting connection. Now, we also went on to learn that the hexagram and the pentagram have been used in occult and serial magic, and it's attributed to the seven old planets outlined in astrology. This was the original purpose of that star. It was made for one reason and one reason only, and that is to connect with the spirits of the planets. That's why all of these symbols, whether it be the pyramid facing up or down, uh, are represent the four earthly elements of fire, air, water, and earth. And when you combine these different elements together, you, uh, you get a combination of elements that are created. And according to 33rd degree Albert Mackey, he says that this is the basis of all hermeticism and the as above, so below principle. So the as above, so below principle is connecting the four earthly elements using the five and six pointed stars to draw down on supernatural powers from the planets so that you can connect with the spirits of, uh, and energies from those planets to help manipulate and control things on this planet. That is the basis of all secret societies right there. Now, in the last lecture, we also showed that the Kabbalah incorporates not only the hexagram and the seven planets, but they connect them to Eastern mysticism and transcendental meditation. And we looked at this many lectures ago where we looked at this whole concept of the seven chakras in your spine and that when you begin to do transcendental meditation and allow the spiritual energies and, and entities to come into you, that you awaken the kundalini serpent. We discussed what that kundalini serpent represented. We connected that serpent back to Satan. We realized that it's a false counterfeit spirit to the Holy Spirit and that that kundalini serpent begins to rise up your spinal cord, giving you the, the burning and tingling sensation in your spine and that it eventually travels all the way up to your crown chakra and, be, and gives you what's referred to as this kundalini awakening where you become this master powerful occultist and and they connect this to the as above so below where where you achieve this henosis where you've now become united with the divine and what's fascinating about it is is that the each of the seven chakras of the spine each of them connect to each of the seven planets with the crown chakra the one in your head being that of saturn so Every, you know, the moment that you think you've got an understanding of this, there's another layer to it, like an onion. It just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. So from there, we began to fast forward and start looking at some very prominent, charged, demonically inspired books. The most important one by far would be the Keys of Solomon. Now, this is supposed to be a pseudo-epigraphical book, meaning that they don't know who wrote it, but... You know, all of the legends and mythos behind this book connects it back to the period of Solomon, that Solomon was the wisest man in the world. We know that he fell into idolatry. We know that he is the one who really helped birth witchcraft, sorcery. He's the one who started the seal of Solomon. And so it's reasonable to think that he did write these books, at least, and, and it got passed down through oral and written tradition. And then somewhere in the Dark Ages, someone consolidated all that information and they named it according to the author of that information, which was Solomon. So the Keys of Solomon are a grimoire, which is a book of spells that are attributed to Solomon. Book number one contains conjurations, invocations, and curses that can summon and constrain spirits of the dead and demons in order to compel them to do the operator's will. It also describes how to find stolen items, become invisible, gain favor, and so on. Now, book number two has to do more with uh, exercising the demons and doing sacrifices, etc. But it's interesting when you look at the Keys of Solomon, you know, like we see in this book down here, this, the Clavicula Solomonis, as it says in the Latin, what's the first thing you see? 
you see all of these talismans, these coins that have all of these symbols on them. And right on the front, you see the talisman of Saturn. It was one of the most important occult symbols there was. And so this is where that six-pointed star comes from. This is not the star of David. This is the seal of Solomon. And, you know, if you the, the complete history of this, in my opinion, would be the fallen angels introduced the six-pointed star and astrology to mankind before the flood. It became a very important, prominent symbol during that era. Then the flood came and wiped everything out. Then all of that was rebirthed with Nimrod and Babylon. They were into bull and star worship. They used the six-pointed star. Then that passed down to the Egyptians. The Egyptians passed it down to the, to the uh, Hebrews. And then also all of the Canaanites adopted it. Then Solomon is the one who really mastered it and perfected it with all of his witchcraft and sorcery. That's where it became widespread and known as the, uh, uh, you know, used to put a curse on people and to be used in witchcraft. Then all the secret societies began to split off from there, including the Masonic Society. And then we see the next time we see it really being used is in the 1500s when John Dee, who's the occultist working for Queen Elizabeth, he began working in Enochian magic, and he used the six-pointed star, which we'll look at in a moment in, in some of his writings. And he really uh, expanded all of this witchcraft teachings. Well, then we pick it up about three or four hundred years later with Eliphas Levi, who uh, he's the one who um, came up with the concept of Baphomet. And, uh, and, and that was an inspired um, drawing through automatic writing. And that was demonically charged, obviously. And then he expanded John Dee's teachings. And then we see this guy show up, you know, in the late 1800s. And he picked up where Eliphas Levi left off. And so each of these men have been operating on the shoulders of the guy before him. And they're just expanding and they're, they're experimenting and they're doing their rituals. Aleister Crowley actually went on to write many, many, many rituals that he invented. You know, he expanded some of the previous ones and he invented a bunch of the new ones. He was so steeped in the occult. He was so demonized. He had so many uh, spirits working through him that they were inspiring him to come up with new uh, rituals. And so we'll take a look at some of that now. And you can see here, these are a couple of fellows that were all buddies back in the day. Aleister Crowley, The Three Magical Books of Solomon. And so you make no mistake, Crowley was completely invested in Solomon. Uh, in this symbol here, he's representing King Solomon's temple. This is supposed to represent Yachin and Boaz, the two pillars, which we know are the pillars of Hercules. It's not a coincidence that he has a pyramid with an all-seeing eye, which represents the eye of Horus or Lucifer, which is the light bearer who's illuminating and shooting out the rays of illumination. You know, all of this has occult meaning. So let's try and take a look at how this this witchcraft works. Aleister Crowley, while under the inspiration of demonic power, wrote a book called Liber O. And in that book, he details the greater ritual of the hexagram. This is one of several charged rituals within the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which is basically Crowley's religion based on Thelema. These rituals are used to invoke or banish the energies of either the planets or the signs of the zodiac. First thing I would tell you is that these energies, is, that's a fancy way of saying demonic power and, and fallen angels. Same thing. Notice that of the planets or the zodiac. In other words, each planet has its own spiritual power and its own demonic entities connected to it as does each sign of the zodiac has its own individual demonic powers and fallen angels associated with it. So, Crowley goes on to say that first you take the hexagram of Earth is used, you trace the astrological sigil of the planet in the center of your hexagram. So, you make the magic circle, you place a hexagram in it, kind of like we see over here. Now, this is a pentagram over here, but you place your six-pointed star inside of it. Then you use the sigils. The sigils are these little glyphs 
that represent each planet and each zodiac. So you have to understand the different symbols of the different planets and the zodiac. Once you've placed your symbols inside of here, then you take your four earthly elements, your wind, your air, your earth, your fire, like we see over here, we see fire and water and different things. Then you recite your spell, your book of conjurations, you do the sacrifice, you release the blood, and all of this is, is using quantum physics to open up a wormhole, if you will. It tears a fabric in, this, in the hole of space and time, and it opens up a window to the higher spiritual dimensions, specifically of what your ritual is targeted towards. So for example, if you're targeting the planet Saturn and the zodiac of Taurus, then it's those spiritual powers that you're drawing down. So Crowley taught that each planet and each sign has good and bad spirits associated with them. As it turns out, the demonic spirit of Saturn is described in the Keys of Solomon as Zazel. Now you may recognize that word because we see in the book of Enoch, we're told that there was a powerful angel by the name of Azazel with an A on it, and that that was the angel that was responsible for the Genesis 6 excursion. As it says in the book, The Keys of Solomon, that it serveth to invoke the spirits who are under the firmament, and Zazel is described as being the presiding spirit of Saturn and has been described as a great angel invoked in Solomonic magic. So at one minute they call it a spirit, but then later they confirm Zazel is an angel. So Crowley is, has been, in his writings, is trying to draw down and invoke the spiritual power of Zazel, who is the principality residing over the planet Saturn, which is obviously pretty wild. So here's sort of the formula. You've got all of your different hexagrams right here. Some are for invoking, some are for banishing demons. And it depends on how you align them and how you, what order in which you draw them out. It has a very specific formula to target whatever individual planet that you have designed. And then if you look over here, you'll see that You've got all of your symbols in here. These are your glyphs or your sigils. Same thing with down here. Each planet has its own symbol that never changes. Each zodiac has its own symbol. So this is how you target individual planets, individual symbols. And what you begin to realize is that the, pen, the pentagram and the hexagram are the two predominant symbols used for all witchcraft. And so this comes back from the Seal of Solomon again. It's not the Star of David. Now, when I learned that Zazel was the presiding angel over Saturn, my first thought was, is this the same fallen angel that we see in the book of Enoch? And initially I wasn't sure because one is referenced Zazel without an A, and Enoch talks about a Zazel with an A. And so thou seest what Azazel has done He's taught all unrighteousness on earth and revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven, which men were striving to learn. Well, it tells us in, later in Enoch what these eternal secrets are. It's the study of the stars, the rotation of the planets, the constellations, etc. So it would stand to reason that this Azazel is the same one residing over Saturn. And they've gone to the daughters of men and have slept with the women and defiled themselves and revealed, revealed to them all kinds of sin. And the women bore giants and the whole earth was filled with unrighteousness. And the whole earth is corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel. To him ascribe the bastards and the reprobates. So we see that Azazel is the kind of the top dog here when it comes to the Genesis 6 incursion. And so as I began to look at some of the symbols here, yes, it's true that when you look at the talisman of, of, of Zazel, you see Z-A-Z-E-L. But in some of the other renditions, like on the backside of it, 
you see A-Z-A-E-L, Azael. So if you put the two together, you've got Azazel, and that's what we see in some of these other symbols here. So in my opinion, we're dealing with the same, same character here. And this is his glyph. This is the sigil. If, if, if a witch wants to try and make a connection to that demonic spirit of Zazel, he has to use this symbol right here. And if you look at that closely, it kind of has, it's kind of reminiscent of the six-pointed star. It's got a pyramid going up as above, and it's got a pyramid going down as below. So if a master occultist has enough information, then they know what planet they want to target, they know what zodiac sign they want to target, they know what specific uh, angel or principality they want to target, and as long as they have each of the respective sigils and talismans, then they can do a ritual to, to do that. And one thing you'll see time and time again is, is that these ancient concepts which should have been forgotten by now, continue to manifest in the minds of men and women today. And there's no question in my mind that it's spiritual. For example, there's a movie called Zazel that's been designed specifically after this angel this uh, of, of Saturn. There's a movie that The Scent of Love is a highly regarded, award-winning American erotic film made in 1995, featuring Zazel, who's the darker spirit of Saturn, and has been described as a great angel invoked in Solomonic magic. Zazel is the character, a, wor a world-famous artist, commissioned to create the most arousing perfume ever. In the course of devising the scent, Zazel paints pictures, views portographs, and wanders among the flowers of her garden each experience inspiring her to envision a powerful sexual fantasy. The film consists of nearly a dozen individual theme sequences which reference and recreate iconography drawn from mythology, religion, literature, film, and Jungian psychology. These include sirens, water nymphs, mermaids, Three Musketeers, Angels and Demons, and the Jungian duality of male and female. So I just think it's fascinating that, you know, you fast forward thousands of years and here you still have men and women making films, um, you know, triple X uh, pornography films based on this whole concept. And and in the movie, their, their themes are things to do with mythology, religion, mermaids which are you know half human half fish nymphs and things like that angels and demons you say well why are they doing this and what i would say is that the same supernatural spirit that was back then is still here today it's still working through mankind um, if you haven't received the holy spirit and you're not following the lord then you know you're you're under the influence of this supernatural spirit and you know these people they're not just waking up and having these clever ideas on their own, but they're under the influence of something else spiritually. And that's what's whispering in their ear and motivating them to do these things. And so when you look at this, you know, this film Zazel was listed as the 26th best adult film out of the 101 greatest adult tapes of all time by the AVN, which is sort of like uh, Oscars of the pornography industry. And, you know, you see on the front cover here that um, you start off with an avatar. The, the, the Hindu god Vishnu um, is the woman. And um, so you just, you know, we continue to see a blending of all of these weird occult uh, concepts and different religions. And uh, if you look closely, you'll see that, you know, here's the pyramid pointing up and they connected it to the Z, the pyramid pointing down. So it's the as above, so below mentality. Now, something that I think is pretty interesting is when you start looking at symbolism, you know, if you've ever followed any of my lectures, one of the things I've said many times is, is that I really spent a lot of time studying symbols because that's how the Illuminati communicate in this world. And even though they can disguise their words, 
And sometimes they can even use Christian phraseology, like, for example, the Illuminati referred to being born again. Well, later I'll show you uh, an example of what that means. It means being born again to the Antichrist, that Antichrist spirit. But when Christians hear that, they can be confused about that. And so one thing that will never lead you astray, though, is the symbols. They, they, they always remain accurate with the symbols for whatever reason. And so when we begin looking at Saturn, what we'll find is that this is where the entire iconography and the whole concept of Father Time comes from. We've all used the phrase Father Time. You know, no man can outrun Father Time as if there's this old man out there who's this ancient wise wizard and he's the one who's controlling the clock. Kind of like the counterpart to Mother Nature, if you will. That there's some old mother, womanly mother nature who's out there controlling the storms and, and the and the cataclysmoses, etc. And so what we begin to find out is, is that Saturn is father time. And we're going to look get into that here pretty significantly. So the first thing you'll see with Saturn worship is this version of father time here. Here's your old man. He's always wearing a big cloak like this because he represents a wizard or a warlock. He's a mystical guy. He's into the occult. He controls the clock of mankind. And um, you'll always see him with a time clock here. That's one of the uh, the, the main symbols is, is the hourglass. The clock is ticking. He decides when to flip it. And then the other thing that you'll see frequently with Father Time is he's the one who's the reaper and the harvester of the world. When he decides that, you know, it's time for the end, then he comes to get you. And that's how it segues over time into the Grim Reaper. So it started off as him being Father Time, and he's controlling everything from above, like we see over here. He's an old wise man who's sitting around watching everything happen throughout eternity. And here's Saturn in the background, see? So because Father Time and Saturn are, are symbolic of each other. And... And he's got his sickle. And when it's time, he's going to come and reap. And so eventually, he gets changed over to the Grim Reaper. Right? He's called that because when he comes to reap, things are, are pretty grim. And, you know, he, he, he gets known for that sickle. So over time, we see him become the Grim Reaper. And you see some similarities. Here's the Grim Reaper. He's represented by a black skull because he's the one who comes for your life. He's the one who decides when it's time to live, when it's time to die. And again, you'll see the same iconography here as you do down here, which is the hourglass. And he's got his big sickle. The other thing you'll notice about him is, is he begins to take on angel wings. You begin to see that the angel of Saturn is the one who's running the, the clock, if you will. He's got his sickle. He's always wearing his black robe. He's got his angel wings, and here is the clock ticking. Same thing here. Here's the Grim Reaper again. He represents death. He's always wearing black. And in this situation, you can see a six-pointed star behind him. Why? Because we now know that the six-pointed star is the star of Rimfan that represents Saturn and the, and the six-pointed hexagram, hexagon on top of the North Pole of Saturn. That's why you'll see these symbols being merged. Same thing over here. Six-pointed star inside of a circle. That represents Saturn. Here is the Grim Reaper with the angelic wings. Put it all together and what do you have? Saturn is the planet that represents time and space in our solar system. And that's why it has a six-pointed geometrical vortex at the top going all the way through to the bottom because it's that planet that's used for opening up a wormhole to the higher dimensions. And so this is a great depiction of it right here. Here is an angel sitting on the northern apex of Saturn. And you see this little opening right here. That represents this angel being able to come in and out of our four-dimensional time space based on the portals of Saturn because Saturn controls time. And guess what? Time and space cannot coexist without each other. They're like peanut butter and jelly. Time and space. It is the time-space continuum. So if you're the god of time, if you're father time, you're also the god of space. 
Like it says here, here's another depiction of him right here, holding the clock. Time waits for no man. Now, as Saturn evolves into the Greek and Roman days, he takes on a little bit of a different personification. He still represents time. He still is the, is, has the sickle in every one of them because he's still the one who's the harvester. But now he begins to do child sacrifice. See, and, and this connects back to the star of Remphan and everything we see in the Bible. We know the Canaanites were using the six-pointed star. That's where Solomon got it. We know they were worshiping the stars in Saturn. And how did they worship? Well, on Saturn's day, they would sacrifice their children by passing them through the brazen bull or through the fire. So we begin to see that Saturn becomes the god of child sacrifice, as we see in these different pictures. Here he is running off with the little children. Notice here he is eating a child. And it's through cannibalism and blood drinking that he, he achieves the child sacrifice also. So this is where the basis of satanic ritual comes from. This is the this is the ancient order of the of the black cube or the ancient order of Saturn, the Saturn death cult that's existed on this planet that connects in with these bloodlines of the Illuminati. All of these pictures you'll see him taking children. Here he is eating the flesh of a child, running off with a child. Um, kind of like the the ancient god, the Greek god Pan. If you remember from past lectures, the Greek god Pan He's this angelic, um, hybridized being that uh, runs off with the children. Only he fornicates with them before he kills them. But um, you'll see that he has the sickle. He comes to do the reaping, and he also has the hourglass. He's responsible for time. He's still the grim reaper. And uh, the other thing you'll see in a lot of pictures is the wings, right? Why do they have wings on them? Because he's angelic. He's not a god. He's an angel. He's one of the major fallen angels that exists under Satan, and maybe he's Satan himself. Maybe this is the, the principality of Lucifer and Satan for all we know. But, uh, you know, when you look at the uh, the Greek version of, of him, he's called Kronos, and cr that's where we get the word chronology, which is the clock or time. And um, if you recall, Kronos was a titan. So when we studied the Battle of the Titans, we already connected that to the fallen angels of Genesis 6 and of the Book of Enoch. So make no mistake, it's all the same thing. Now this is where things start getting interesting. The Lord was gracious enough to give me a, a, an amazing confirmation this week. As I began looking at some of the symbolism of Saturn, he takes on a more hybridized theme at some point. And so here, you see the God of Saturn. Or, Kron or Kronos. Now, he's always going to have the angel wings because he's a fallen angel. He's always going to have the big sickle. That's your proof right there. It's the same guy. Same thing with this picture. He's got the fall, uh, the wings, and he's got his great big sickle. He's getting ready to harvest. He's the, he's the timekeeper, the grim reaper. But here you'll notice a slight nuance. He's a hybrid. If you look at his face, he's got, looks like, you know, almost like a wolf man. He's a goat man. And look at his feet. Look at his feet right here. Those are not human feet. Those are cloved hooves. Same thing here. He's got hairy legs with hooves. So now we're really getting a gist of who Saturn really is. He is a hybrid goat looking fallen angelic god. Well, I, I knew I had seen that somewhere, and I really kind of focused and thought about it, asked the Lord to reveal it to me, and it was on the cover of uh, Sir Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, and that was the confirmation. Um, if you go back and you look at the book of New Atlantis, which we'll do now, there's this weird insignia on the front. Four or five lectures ago, we zoomed in on it, and what do we see? We see this human being who's been in a cave. She's naked. She's cold and she's afraid. She's been living in this dark cave. And all of a sudden, this higher powerful entity shows up and he takes a hold of her, a stronghold. He grabs a hold of her and he's pulling her out of the darkness and introducing her into the light. And what do you see about him? He's got a big, long, giant sickle. And behind that giant sickle are angel wings, 
a big long beard because he's wise and elderly. And then he comes down into a hybrid body with hooves for feet. And then none other is the hourglass all inside of a circle. What are we dealing with here? The great God Saturn or Satan, Lucifer, the light bearer, the one responsible for the hybridization in Genesis 6, uh, the one who's fulfilling the proto-evangelium of the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. This is who Sir Francis Bacon was writing about when he, he was referring to the new Atlantis in reference to America and the secret destiny of America. Atlantis has always been and always will be the pre-flood world that was set up by the antediluvian Nephilim kings. That's what Atlantis is. That's what Bacon and all the New World Orderists are interested in getting back to. And that's why he named on the front of his book, Hidden Truth Brought Forward by Time. And how interesting that could be. Literally, literally brought back by the God time. And the way the hidden truth is going to be brought back by time is that the God of Saturn, this fallen angel, is going to be used in witchcraft to open up a doorway or a, or a, a hole in the fabric of space-time, specifically through Saturn, in order to manifest these fallen angels and demonic powers into our solar system, where they can come back as extraterrestrial entities in the last days. Now, if you're new to this channel, then some of this is going to sound pretty far out there. But if you've been watching some of the previous lectures, they should be building on themselves by now. And what you learn is guys like Francis Bacon, he was a Rosicrucian, he was a master Kabbalist, he immersed himself into symbolism, he was into the secret societies, he was a well-documented occultist, he was a pederast, he frequently communicated with spirit guides, he was a necromancer, he received inspiration for all of his novel writings through these uh, channeled doctrines, and so it was the demons and devils that were working through him. And then he passed it on through his secret society of the Rose and the Cross, which is Rosicrucian Gnostic Christ, uh, Christianity, but it's Gnosticism blended in it. And it is not a coincidence that we see a hybrid winged creature leading a naked woman out of a cave. And I've just connected him very clearly to the Grim Reaper of Father Time who represents Saturn. And so we can know without a doubt that that's who this is. Now, that is what the Atlantis before the flood was, was a world that had these kind of entities running around. That's why all of ancient Roman, Egyptian, and Greek iconography have nothing but hybrids. And you can see the connection between this guy down here, who's this winged beast, half human, half man with, with hooves. Compare him to Baphomet, which is a winged hermaphrodite with horns and, and, and hooves. And he's sitting on top of a planet because it always represents this cosmological circumstances where, you know, extraterrestrials come from space. And so make no mistake, all of these creatures, you know, here's Pan with the same hooves that we just saw on, on the uh, god of Saturn. They're all connected. These are all different renditions of the fallen angels. And they have one goal. And that goal is to bring about the old world of Atlantis, which is when this world was covered with nothing but hybrids. And there were bloodlines of hybrid Illuminati, Nephilim kings and queens and all of the hybrids underneath them. And it was so bad that it says in Genesis 6 that their hearts were only evil continually and that it grieved God, that God had grieved and regretted ever even making mankind because things got that bad. It was so bad that he had to kill every man, woman, child, and animal on the planet, except for the genetically pure. And at that point, the only ones left were Noah and his immediate family and a handful of animals. This is the great secret. And this is what is going to come about in the last days before uh, Jesus returns. That's why all the sci-fi movies that you see now all the new movies coming out are constantly about weird genetic manipulation, hybridization, extraterrestrials, uh, you know, Hercules and, and um, 
the X-Men. I mean, it, it just we're, we're just completely consumed by this concept. So earlier I had mentioned how people use words and they can have multiple meanings. Here's a great example. This band, Black Sabbath, have a, a CD they made called Born Again. And obviously when we hear that phrase, as Christians, we think that, you know, that obviously means receiving the Holy Spirit. But here is a satanic band that obviously means it in a different aspect. They mean it as being born again to a satanic spirit. As you can clearly see depicted here with an image of a baby who is a son of Satan who would represent the Antichrist. And what I find even more intriguing is they just so happen to have the symbol that we see flying on the flag of Israel on the back of their album cover. And the reason why is pretty obvious. That's a witchcraft symbol. That is a six-pointed star, which represents 666 inside of a circle. That's how you harness spiritual power. And these Satanists, they obviously know this. That's why they chose the symbol. It's the rest of humanity that doesn't recognize this. And as we continue to unravel and reveal how that symbol got put on the Israeli flag and who is responsible for it, I think that we'll begin to see the truth unfold. If you look close here, there's a bunch of astronomical symbols here, and then there's a picture of the crucifixion in the middle inside of the cube. And so, you know, these people who um, are trying to be born again in terms of this satanic spirit, they always have to come against Christ with their symbolism. But this is why it's important to look at symbols, because words can be confusing. Here's another interesting band connection. If you look at this image on the left, this represents Father Time, or Saturn, the Grim Reaper. He's got his robe on. He's holding a large, um, looks like a planter. You can see that he's got the devil horns. He's got the sun behind him. And, or is that, that actually is the moon, I believe, giving off its light. And he's holding a lantern. That's the timekeeper. And inside of that lantern is a six pointed star emitting light. So it's, you know, there's a lot of unusual symbolism, but that six pointed star represents Saturn. And so this is a depiction of Saturn. Now compare him to the guy over here on the cover of Led Zeppelin. Now, we've already reviewed this uh, song in the past, looked at the lyrics of it. We've already revealed how occultic it is. Led Zeppelin was a big follower of Aleister Crowley. Jimmy Page is a known Luciferian and Satanist. These are some of his albums over here you know, where he's a disciple of Aleister Crowley. Um, he bought Aleister Crowley's home in, in Scotland, and he's been immersed in Thelema, and uh, all of Crowley's religion. Here's an image of a, a album he put out called Lucifer Rising. For that movie, Lucifer Rising, that starred, um, I believe, Bobby Boussoulet. And so, you know, make no mistake, this guy is a, he's an occultist. So is it any shocking that he would have all kinds of symbolism on the cover of his album? Now, Stairway to Heaven... It's an amazing song. Most people have heard it, and it is. It's a fantastic song. I've always loved that song. It was rated number 26 in the all-time greatest songs ever of all time. And just take a look at it. So on the front of the cover, we're dealing with an old man. He's wearing a, 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 a dark cloak. Now, he doesn't have a sickle because that would be too obvious if they put the sickle on it. But he is holding the staff, so he kind of looks like this old wizard. And then here is the moon shining. Same thing we see over here with Saturn. He's got the moon or the sun in the background. And then, of course, he's holding a lantern, right? That's what this guy is holding over here, a lantern. And inside the lantern is a six-pointed star emitting light. Over here is a six-pointed star emitting light. So, what are we dealing with here? Well, we're obviously dealing with the god of the planet Saturn. That's who Led Zeppelin is trying to uh, symbolize here on his cover. 
And obviously it's, it's very, you know, the word occult means hidden, but in plain sight. So it's right there in front of you. But unless you've been, you know, educated in these different concepts, you'd never know the difference. And so what that means is, is that this entire album is charged. It's demonically charged. There's power behind it. And, you know, when, when the demonic are involved in the music, the music is pretty captivating, pretty mesmerizing. That's the word we will often use, that, that it can be mesmerizing on a person. Same thing if you go back and look at some of the symbols that we had in the past. I had done a lecture on Jack Parsons quite a few months ago, and I didn't realize at the time that there was some Saturn symbolism here. We see, you know, Jack Parsons was the one who joined forces with Ron Hubbard, the father of Scientologist, and they did the Babylon working ritual based on uh, some of Crowley's writings to try and bring in the Babylon whore from the book of Revelations, 666. And, you know, they, they claimed later that they were trying to, to shatter the, the boundaries of space and time. Well, who's the father of time? Saturn. If you want to break the boundaries of space and time, you've got to go through Saturn to do it. So as, you know, we go back and look now and we can see the writing on the wall. Strange angel. We're dealing with angels. In the background is a picture of Saturn. And then down here, what do we see? We see an hourglass because Saturn is the one who's in control of time and space. And if you want to try and break the boundaries of time and space, that's who you're going to deal with. So there's the symbolism. Here's an alive person, and he's bleeding out into down here where there's a skull, which represent, re, this represents that death is coming for us all, that we're all, we're all, you know, time waits for no man. Then over here, we see some images of Buddha and Kali, the destroyer, which connects us to CERN, and it also connects us to Eastern mysticism. And we'll find when we get to that aspect of the lecture that some of their gods represent Saturn as well. And so there's this great deal of connectivity. What's really fascinating, though, one of the greatest supernatural revelations that I've ever received from the Lord is later we're going to show a situation where CERN, the Large Hydrogen Collider, has a bunch of occult symbolism where we actually see through CERN opening up a doorway through, through Saturn to let fallen angels in. And I know that sounds pretty insane and ludicrous, but I think when you see that lecture, which will be in the next couple of weeks, that um, it'll speak for itself. But, you know, and then of course the Nazis have this symbol here, and this represents the black sun. And, and we have a lot to say about that when we get into the Nazi lectures, looking at the Vril Society and the Thule Society, but also, you know, NASA, you know, uh, Von Braun, who was a, a Nazi, he was the one responsible for um, creating the Saturn V rockets. And it's not a coincidence that they chose that name. And uh, when you study NASA, you see all kinds of occult concepts. And again, we have another lecture with NASA coming up in the near future. But what you begin to see is that all of these people all understand the power of Saturn. They understand the power of its, uh, the spiritual power behind it and the dark power and the dark energy and the dark matter that are connected to it. And as we're going to see going forward, I believe it's going to be very important in uh, bringing about the last day's manifestations of the, of the fallen angels and the extraterrestrials. So I believe that Satan is basically represented by the planet Saturn and that the fallen angels reside over that celestial body, specifically that of the fallen angel Azazel, or at least that's according to the keys of Solomon and Crowleyan teachings. Now, these secret societies have learned how to tap into the astral energy and power that comes from Saturn and planets like it. And they've done this through magic and witchcraft and rituals, as we've demonstrated, especially using the hexagram. Saturn is the black sun of our galaxy. It has a lot of occult and dark energy associated with it. 
and occultists like Crowley understood that there are higher dimensions that could be accessed through the mechanism of witchcraft and sorcery in quantum physics. If they could figure out how to unlock the secrets of the universe, then they could create a portal through the fabric of space and time, which would allow them to interact and communicate with the higher dimensions, the fifth, sixth, and seventh dimensions. This is where the demonic powers, principalities, and fallen angels exist. And this is exactly what they've done multiple times in the past. If you recall from past lectures, we talked about how Aleister Crowley and a, a high-level female medium by the name of Roddy Minor, they did the Amalantra working ritual in New York in 1918, and they claimed that they opened up a doorway, uh, a, a higher dimension, if you will, a um, portal to a higher dimension, and allowed Lamb, a three-foot gray entity, to manifest through that portal. And it was a physical manifestation where they were able to see it and communicate with it. And so they created a doorway between the, the spiritual realm and our realm, and they let it in. And then later, as we discussed earlier, they did the Babylon working ritual, which achieved the same thing. So these rituals are designed to shatter the boundaries of space and time and to open up a doorway between us and the spirit realm. And Saturn is the gatekeeper, if you will, between space and time. And this is essentially what kicked off the UFO era in the 1940s, along with all of the occult ritualistic stuff that the Nazis were doing. And so the magic and witchcraft has evolved greatly since then. I mean, that was almost 100 years ago. And today, the occultists and the mysticism has, has gone to a much higher level and that's what we're going to see when we get into things like the quantum computer and how it's a high-level Ouija board, when we get into 5G technology, when we get into CERN, the hydrogen collider. They're taking all these principles that guys like Eliphas Levi and Crowley and John Dee had mastered, only now they're starting to add the technological aspect to it, and it's making things a lot more sophisticated. And this is how they're going to bring about the, the fallen angels in the last days. And you look at the imagery here, again, you've got the old man. He represents the planet Saturn. He's got the angel wings because he's a fallen angel. He has the sickle because he's the reaper. He, and he has the clock that's ticking, the hourglass, because he's the one who's overseeing humanity. And he decides the fate of humanity. Or so that's what the occultists would have you believe. And this is all being governed under the all-seeing eye with the rays of illumination. This is the Illuminati who are serving under Lucifer or Satan. Obviously, for those of us who receive the Holy Spirit, we know better than this. We know that Yahuwah from the Old Testament and Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who fulfilled all the Old Testament scriptures and the third person of the Trinity, of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, um, that is the one who controls our destiny and our future. And the one in us is greater than the one in the world. And in the end, we win. And that's the only thing that matters. That's why Jesus said, don't worry about the one who can take your life, but worry about the one who can take your life and your soul. Now, I'm not going to go through this entire ritual, but I just want to give you an understanding of who they're praying to here. This is a, the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram. Um, you you uh, start the ritual with a Kabbalistic cross. You extend your arms to form a cross, and you say in the Latin, I-N-I-R, Ignis Renovatur, Natura Integra. Now that is fire renews earth incessantly. What's interesting is that's also the same initials inscribed on the cross during the crucifixion, and it represents Jesus the Nazarene King of the Jews. Um, that's an interesting connection. But basically, as they do this ritual, you'll see that they're talking about the Egyptian god Osiris. They're talking about the female god Isis, who's an Egyptian goddess. Uh, there We have some Greek gods, Typhon and Apophis here. Um, they continue to do all these different rituals, and they talk about all of these different items. You have the zodiac involved, Virgo, Isis, Scorpio, which is the zodiac, um, and then, of course, you know, all of these different entities. So, and you can see that they're involving all kinds of different occult gods, Egyptian gods, the Zodiac, and etc. to try and 
uh, bring about these demonic forces. Now, they always conclude the, um, the ritual with this word, Ararita. We'll take a look at that in a minute. So according to occultist Eliphas Levi, the word Ararita is the verbum in arable of the sages of the Alexandrian school. Now, the Alexandrian school is after uh, Alexander the Great. This is back in the Greek period, coming off the heels of the Egyptian period. So he's claiming that all of these occult concepts go back even to then, which we know is true. And he was a, this guy here was a was a, a Kabbalist, and so Hebrew Kabbalists wrote that the word Yava was interpreted by the sound Ararita. And this expresses the, the triplicity of the secondary Kabbalistic principle, which is the principle of dualism. Dualism is the means and the equal unity of the first and the final principle. This is where the concept of the yin and the yang of good and evil come from. Uh, he goes on to say that it's as well as the alliance between the triad and the tetrad. And so this is the basis of the as above, so below understanding. But it's interesting that he says that it, the importance of the above two rituals cannot be overstressed. To practice an evocation or any other type of magic, you have to come in contact with pure and divine energy. The banishing rituals consecrate your work area and make it a holy place where these energies can descend upon you. These rituals also have to be performed after your magic work is done to make sure any forces that were invoked or evoked are effectively banished. So to, an invocation is to bring an, an energy or entity down to you or into you. Whereas an evocation is to get rid of an entity. So a banishing ritual, apparently you have to clear the area of all of the charged energy, you know, the good and bad energy. So they do banishing rituals to consecrate the workplace. And once they feel they've successfully cleared the air, so to speak, now they can do their invocations to specific entities. And when they draw a circle around the hexagram and do the ritual, that's opening up a vortex from that circle to the higher dimensions. And when the, when the divine energy and entities are then invoked within that circle, the circle contains that energy within it. And it's not until the practitioner specifically releases that energy into the universe, if you will, that it's free to go and do what the ritual was, was designed to do. And so this was one of the guys that Aleister Crowley idolized and and utilized a lot of his writings and he wrote this book here transcendental magic as you can see it's got the six-pointed star with an old wizard with a long beard in in between it and it has the uh you see the dualism here of the dark pyramid here and the white pyramid going up and we see the ouroboros which is the snake eating its tail that that shows the eastern mystical principles of reincarnation and recycling as does the word transcendental magic, that over time what we see is Western occultism blending with Eastern mysticism, blending with Jewish and Islamic Kabbalism. And when you smash all these things together, you get you know the, 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 the modern concepts of witchcraft and sorcery. Now, John D was the mathematician, astrologer, and occult philosopher and advisor to Queen Elizabeth in the 1500s. He's the one who basically wrote lots of literature and uh, through automatic writing, he came up with the Enochian magic language. So now they have their own letters where they can write uh, their own um, you know, doctrines, if you will. And one of the things that he used was uh, something called the Holy Table. Kind of used it almost like a um, Ouija board. And in this holy table, he was able to connect with the spirit realm through alchemy and divination. And uh, he, John D. was 
a practitioner of the what they call Solomonic magic, which goes back to the keys of Solomon. Notice what you see on the cover of it. It's the six-pointed star. So, you know, no, no shocker there. We know that this is an important symbol in witchcraft. Now, this Enochian magic derives from the writings of Solomon, and this is the formation of the Kabbalah, this Jewish mysticism. It's based on sacred geometry and the tree of life, and it's based on something referred to as Metatron's cube. So we've been looking at the cube through this whole lecture, and now we're going to just add another nuance to it. This, this six-pointed star, this hexagon that makes the cube, well, that cube is referred to as Metatron's cube. And according to ancient Eastern traditions and Jewish traditions, Metatron is, was Enoch. They claim that when Enoch was translated to heaven, that he, he went through a transformation process and became known as, as, as Metatron. Now, there's nothing in our scripture to suggest any of this is true. But this is what the Kabbalah and the Talmudic Jews believe. If you read the Babylonian Talmud, they talk about Metatron being the angelic being of Enoch. And there's a lot of ancient mystical writings that supposedly come from this entity Metatron. So according to our Bible, God took Enoch to heaven in Genesis 5. And uh, he did not die, but he was translated. Now, in the Jewish mysticism, he was then transformed into the angel Metatron. And he can be represented by the cube. And in sacred geometry, this archangel Metatron, he becomes the angel of life. He oversees the flow of energy through a mystical cube to, known as Metatron's cube, which contains all of the geometric shapes in God's creation, and it represents the patterns that make up everything in the universe. These duties tie in with Metatron's work overseeing the Tree of Life in the Kabbalah, where Metatron sends creative energy down from the top crown chakra all the way throughout the body. Metatron's cube contains every shape that exists in the universe, and those shapes are the building blocks of all physical matter, and they make up all of the platonic solids that the philosopher Plato linked to the spirit realm including all three and four dimensional shapes ranging everywhere from crystals to the human DNA. And so that's very interesting. So here's Metatron's cube. It's the same thing that we've been looking at. It's a six sided cube, which makes a six pointed star in the center of it. It represents a mathematical six, 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 and you, you can, you can achieve any one of these images inside of Metatron's cube. Now, it's interesting that they talked about crystals and DNA here, that, that you can even see the Metatron cube existing within those structures. The Lord wanted me to go back and try and make some strange connections here. You were trying to continue to keep this. As we're learning this material, we're trying to keep in the back of our mind that this all involves the extraterrestrial movement and this future deception that's coming so now based on what we've learned about saturn metatron's cube the six-pointed star etc let's go back and take a look at one of the most um interesting groups that started from new ager and occultist george van tassel if you recall he was hosting weekly group meditations in the 1950s underneath giant rock which was uh in the in the joshua tree area in the desert in california it's a highly charged area on the ley lines there and it's the intersection of powerful geomagnetic forces shortly after this he claimed he was abducted by an extraterrestrial from venus who telepathically gave him instructions to build the integraton which is this fascinating building down here that looks kind of like a, a, a spaceship and um it's based on a high voltage Tesla coil and a split ring resonator that generates ultra wide EMF frequencies, which cause coronal discharge and negative air ionization as a result of plasma generation. So it's quite sophisticated. Now Van Tassel taught that every biological cell in the body has a unique resonant electromagnetic frequency and each living cell in our body functions much like a tuned circuit 
with its DNA strand acting as a self-inducting coil so that every strand of DNA can receive frequencies coming from the outside world, electromagnetic frequencies, and those DNA strands are fluid. They can shift and change shape, kind of like Metatron's cube. They can shift and change shape into all different three-dimensional structures. And so, you know, and he claimed that this, this machine down here, the Integraton, was, was creating these strong EMF frequencies that would resonate with all of the cells in one's body and basically recharge the cellular structure of the body like an electrical battery, okay? Now, it was Van Tassel and a few of his buddies who really kind of kicked off this era of uh, the Ashtar Command, which are these tall Nordic aliens, supposedly from Venus. And these are the ones who claim that Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad and all of these different people over the last 5,000 years were really all aliens that they sent to planet Earth to help out humanity when it was in a desperate need for change. They claimed that the Star of Bethlehem was really a UFO and Jesus is really an extraterrestrial. And they are represented by this guy down here. We'll take a closer look at him in a minute. That's Lord Ashtar and the Jesus, the, the Christ figure is known as Lord Sananda. Now, if you recall, Ashtar Command has chosen a select group of occultists and new agers on the planet who have the correct vibratory body aura and that they're going to be snatched up to the heavens by extraterrestrials during a process known as the ascension process, which seems very much similar to or a counterfeit of what the Bible refers to as the rapture of the church. And alien, these, these Ashtar alien beings claim that they've been sent to prevent mankind from destroying the earth with nuclear weapons. So this is really a lot of the new age ideology that's going on out there. We're going to take a look at it and just try to connect some dots with, with what we're learning. So the Ashtar Command is an airborne division of the Great Brotherhood of Light under the administrative direction of Commander Ashtar and the spiritual guidance of Lord Sananda, the Commander-in-Chief, known to us Earthlings as Jesus the Christ. They say that Ashtar is composed of millions of starships and many civilizations, and they're here to assist Earth and humanity through the current cycle of planetary cleansing and polar realignment. And they use the analogy that they're like midwives in the birth process of humanity from dense physical beings to more of these etheric spiritual bodies of light capable of ascending into the fifth and higher dimensions. So it's all about this spiritual evolution of mankind to these higher spiritual realms. The Ashtar Command is a group of extraterrestrials, angels, and light beings, and millions of starships all working together to coordinate the activities of the space fleet of the Western Hemisphere, all under the spiritual guidance of Sananda, the most radiant one, an ascended master who walked the earth and was known as Jesus the Christ. Now, ascended masters come from Hinduism and Tibet. So we're blending Eastern mysticism in with the extraterrestrial movement. They're basically saying that all of the ascended masters that all of the Tibetans are communicating with and worshiping are the same thing as these Nordic aliens that these Californians were communicating with in the 50s. They also talk about how they have 144,000 light workers called eagles that are here to assist in the ascension process. This is obviously a counterfeit of the 144,000 from each tribe of uh, the 12 tribes of Israel that we see in the book of Revelations. Now they go on to say that all of the world religions were sponsored in different cultures and eras to focus the attention of the people upon some aspect of divine reality. In other words, what they're saying is, is that they are the ones who've been responsible for all of the world's religions. Branches of the Great White Brotherhood were established throughout the world under the occult law for the furtherance of the divine plan in the various cultures and the root races. They even go on to say that they were responsible for designing all of the secret societies 
and the mystery schools that were formed throughout history in order to convey all of their higher spiritual teachings. And if made public, it would result in persecution and execution for going against the established superstitions, doctrines, and dogmas. So they're, they're claiming to be responsible for all the secret societies. They go on to say that although in previous eras there had been a need for secrecy, but today that's no longer the case. They're finally setting aside the occult law which, which created all these secret society and mystery schools, and this all stopped in the 1930s. And this was a worldwide action done by the Great White Brotherhood so that the earth could progress. This is now a new dispensation in which we set aside the occult law on December 31st, 1930. Beloved children of earth, you stand upon the threshold of the ages, its door is being held open by the great ones of love. That door is this spiritual doorway that they're talking about between our four dimensional time space and the fifth and sixth and seventh dimension. That door is being held open by the great ones of love through all these secret societies, etc., and the occultism. Whoever invite you to walk consciously by their side in the light, no matter what the activities in the world are, walk with the light and in the light. Then you will find a master of the light who has trod this self-same path before you, whoever watches and stands by your side, revealing the true way. The cycle changes and we enter into a new dispensation that brings with it a safer, more powerful, and yet rapid means by which one climbing the path to attainment is enabled to hold perfect contact with the great cosmic light. Okay, so where am I going with all this? Well, let's take a look at their symbols and how it is that they're going to lead us to these higher spiritual dimensions where we can receive this great cosmic light. And of course, you understand that I believe the great cosmic light is Lucifer, the light bearer, who's emitting the false light, and it's the counterfeit light. Now, before I move on, I want to revisit some symbolism that we've looked at in past lectures. If you recall, we had said in the past that anytime you see these concentric circles within concentric circles, it means that you're getting ready to do a time warp from one realm or one dimension to another. Everybody knows that Alice in Wonderland goes down the rabbit hole and they say, let's find out how deep the rabbit hole really goes. As she follows the rabbit, you go through the circles, the circles, the circles, and boom. She exits from one a plane of existence and goes into another through a doorway connecting the two. Same thing over here. The, these, these circles always represent hidden portals. Same thing with the twilight zone. That's why they have all these circles creating this depth. You can see that you're going down this tunnel here until you get down here. And what happens when you get down here? Little door opens up and you're able to astral project and leave your body and go into another dimension. Now, put that in context with what we know about Saturn. At the northern apex of Saturn is this circular object with an eye right in the middle. And we see all these concentric circles within concentric circles going counterclockwise, exactly like what we see right here. It's, and in the center of it, they say, is a vortex. And there's a vortex located at the southern tip. So there's some kind of internal vortex going on within this planet. This is the planet of space and time. Now let's put that in context of what we're going to read. This is a writing from Ashtar Command. Those of you who remain during the ascension process, those of you who remain behind will pass through the fire and water. That's an interesting expression because as we learned earlier, Fire and water are the opposite symbols of each other. They're, they're two of the four earthly elements, and they represent opposites. And when you put those two symbols together, guess what it makes? It makes a six-pointed star. And that'll become pertinent in a minute when we look at the symbol for Ashtar Command, which is a hexagram. So again, those who remain behind uh, to pass through the fire and water must know the reasons why they will not be lifted off. 
depending on the openings into your dimension at the time of your gathering. So the dimensions are going to open up. We're in a four space time dimension. We have height, width, length, and time. And there's going to be an opening or a doorway to a higher dimension. You will either be beamed aboard physically or it will be of necessity to have an out-of-body experience. So what they're saying is depending on how things work out, you're either going to physically go or you're just going to go in spirit. Now, I think this becomes pertinent when we look at the um, UFO abduction phenomenon where there have been two doctors that we're going to look at later who spent a lot of time studying this. And I think what's flabbergasted them the most is that they come to a place where they realize that it's clearly a spiritual phenomenon that often involves out-of-body experience, but yet there's still a physicality to it, that the people come back and they've really had physical marks on their body, physical chips put into their body, physical eggs and sperm removed, but yet there's still this supernatural, spiritual, out-of-body uh, astral projection going on. And so what we'll begin to see over time is that sometimes the dimensional warping that they're going to describe here, the way that these dimensions collapse down on themselves, the way that the boundaries of space and time begin to fold over on themselves, you can get spiritual changes out of body astral projections along the ethereal plane, but there's also a physical physicality to it too that's difficult to understand. And we'll get into that more as we proceed forward. But as they go on to say, with all of these acute electromagnetic changes that'll be happening on planet Earth during the ascension process, dimensional warping is taking place. What does that mean? It means that the dimensions are starting to overlap, they're starting to collapse, they're starting to integrate. And in doing so, there are going to be pathways between the realms. Look what they say. Certain doors which are normally open, paths between realms are closing temporarily during these configurations. Most important to note is the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. When Mars is heavily aspected, we also find the narrowing of the dimensional passageways. They go on to specify, this is not the ley lines we're talking about, that's just charged energy. But this is the passageways between them. And so, just like we see down here, there are doorways that can be opened from, let's say that this is the spirit realm. This is the fifth or sixth dimension. Well, over here is our realm. That's the, the third and fourth dimension. And when you, when you go through these dimensional warping, through these vortexes, you get a tunnel that connects the two, just like we see in this image. And that's what we're dealing with with Saturn. That's what we're dealing with with this hurricane at the northern top that has a vortex in it. This is what the witchcraft and the sorcery is achieving. When they put, when they draw the hexagram, they put it in a circle, they do all the rituals, and they point it towards the planet Saturn, and they do it, all the things at the right time and the right way with the right numbers. All of that occult energy begins to cause dimensional warping of that planet in such a way that a hole is opened up between our galaxy and the higher dimensions, and it allows the entities access into our realm, if you will. And this is where the aliens are going to come into play. This is where the ships, all of it is going to manifest from. It's highly sophisticated. I don't pretend to understand all the inner workings of it, but you know, as a confirmation, we need to take a look at some of their symbology. They just so happen to use Metatron's cube or the six pointed star as their predominant symbol of the Ashtar command. So let's continue reading. Whenever evacuation must be executed, this is absolutely, absolutely dependent upon mankind's free will. In other words, they're trying to create all of this new age ideology so that mankind will finally enter into the age of Aquarius and want to accept the spiritual evolutionary process, but they, they're, they're not going to force it upon us. 
at this very moment, we're preparing for each one of you a pendant. This is no ordinary pendant, but one similar to those worn in Atlantis. That's their words, not mine. Once again, they're bringing about this ancient mythological land of Atlantis. You know, we just saw a book written by a 16th century Kabbalistic um, occultist by the name of Sir Francis Bacon, who has an image of a hybrid reaper on the front pulling a naked woman out of a dark cave. And he's got a time clock there. And we very clearly demonstrated that that was the planet Saturn and that he was a hybrid and that he likely is a fallen angel who can be traced back to before the flood. And some of our previous lectures have revealed that that they're obsessed with the pre-flood world of Atlantis where the uh, Nephilim god kings were in control of the world, that, that the fallen angels had manifested themselves in the flesh on this planet. And so now they're talking about they're going to give everybody a pendant similar to those worn in Atlantis, which will be able to uh, work through the strong electromagnetic fields around the crystals. In the center of the pendant is a small body crystal. This is a diamond. If you look at it here, crystal diamonds, they have, when light shines through them, they produce the full spectrum of light. That's why they're clear and you can see through them. And these are attuned to the vibrational frequencies of every commander. Preparation of the crystals is going on at a feverish pace aboard the host command ship. Diamond crystals have excellent reflection and conduction properties. Occultists and New Agers refer to them as ascension stones, and they can take you to the highest spiritual vibration possible while still being in your physical body. They act as powerful amplifiers when you're using them with a small stone. These crystals have metaphysical properties and are strong stones to aid astral travel and help connect you to the astral plane. They also help you communicate with your spirit guides. These diamonds are said to boost your immune system and they can heighten your ability with lucid dreaming. And these crystal, the strong crystal energy can activate your third eye chakra, your crown chakra, your soul chakra, and your etheric chakras. And as we learned earlier, when we look at the tree of life in Kabbalah and the six pointed star, it lines up with the seven planets and it lines up with the seven chakras. So this is all kind of starting to come together. And we really have to ask our question, ask the question why this Nordic extraterrestrial entity is wearing a six pointed crystal diamond Metatron's cube hexagram on his chest which happens to be the same symbol, by the way, that all of the occult societies going back to Babylon, going back to Egypt, um, going back to Greece, were using for star worship, child sacrifice, etc. And let's not forget also that it's a, uh, a geometric and mathematical representation of 666. Now, this is Andromeda Rex. He's one of the uh, entities in the Ashtar Command, and he says that communication will be greatly enhanced through mental telepathy. By wearing the body crystal, one's vibrations will be stepped up and a more synchronous match can be established between the realms. Assuming that maybe this is something like the Mark of the Beast, think about the power it has. It connects everybody through mental telepathy. It helps bridge the different realms to the spirit realm so that the fallen angels and the entities can have direct access to your your host body they say a matter of vibration is all that defines dimensions uh, that's why the new agers and the occultists are always trying to tweak the vibration and frequency because that's what opens up the doorways between these dimensions that are superimposed on top of each other they're not permitted to give out times dates or whatever but to reiterate he says first there will be the gathering of the eagles. This consists of many of the Lord's hosts, two or more contingencies from a galaxy far away, expertly trained for planetary evacuation in time of the dire need. These brave souls of light have volunteered to assist us when we reach the crisis point in Earth's destination. So when this, when this planet gets real close to the end times, to destruction through World War III, nuclear weapons, etc., they say that's when they're going to show up at the crisis point and, and this is all going to go down. 
After the meeting and blending of those who come from the planet Earth itself, a triune council will be formed. The ascended master angelic realm blended with the universal and the Earth, all blended together, all hybridized together. The survival of man that he may evolve into capital man, that is human, heavenly universal man. After that conclave, then the real gathering of the light commanders takes place. After that event, the real work commences as all heaven and light upon the earth strive to bring the planet earth into its proper alignment with the Christ potential. The advent, that means the second coming, the advent of the Christ light, not a person, will create great turmoil. That's the tribulation. Most inhabitants of Earth cannot endure the vibrations. You'll have to do much work by then. Evacuation plans are on schedule. We need everybody's help. I thank you in the great light Andromeda Rex. Here we're told by Theodora, the group mind, which will be this hive mind, this collective consciousness. Uh, Theodora is an entity within Ashtar Command who downloaded, spiritually downloaded this information into occultist and new ager Yvonne Cole. Yvonne Cole goes on to write in her demonically inspired doctrines that greetings in the light of Ashtar, Earth is a free will planet and under a prime directive to not interfere with it. But we do all we can within the directive to offer assistance and protection. We send down wave upon wave of light filled energy to bombard your inner souls so that the encoded memories of who you truly are will awaken and begin to help us from your level of awareness. In other words, they're saying that within our encoded memories of our DNA are distant memories of when they came down and put their DNA on this planet and helped propagate the human species. They go on to talk about, it's all about the new age concepts of you have to be lifted into a higher dimension and once you get into the fifth dimension, the dualistic system is non-existent. Deceit and fear are non-existent. Telepathy is the main form of communication. Love and light are the rule. Those who choose to remain in the third dimensional levels may do so, but not on planet Earth. They will go to a place where they continue to grow at their own level. The rest will ascend with Mother Earth and be caretakers in the thousand-year quest of peace promised by all of your great teachers of the past. This is the uh, counterfeit to the millennial reign of Christ. We are honored to be part of this graduation. Sincerely, Adonai. So you can see they've got some pretty sophisticated uh, doctrines that um, reinterpret our Bible. So let's just go back over what we know. We know that the six-pointed star is the oldest witchcraft symbol ever in recorded history. And it's always been the predominant symbol for Satanism, Luciferianism. It's always been the predominant symbol for child sacrifice. And it's represented by 666, which we're told in our Bible is the number of the beast. And that everybody who receives it is going to lose their soul. And they're all going to have one mind and become part of the beast system. And they are no longer redeemable. Now combine that knowledge with the fact that there are these extraterrestrial entities coming from outer space who look like us and in their symbolism they're saying hey we're the ones who started you he's holding up his hand and this is an opening into his hand you can see the blood and the plasma and the cells inside here see how it's emitting light he's a light being and he's saying look here he's the one who gave us the double alpha helix dna strand that's exactly what our DNA looks like. Now, what do you see over here on his chest? None other than a six-pointed star hexagram in a crystal form. Now, compare that image right there with the image that you see on the front of the talisman of Saturn. It's the same image. Compare that with the image you see right here on the northern apex of Saturn. It's the same image. These entities are the ones who said they started all the secret societies and the as above, so below mystery schools. Now move over to the right. 
you see another interesting looking fella, Nordic alien, who has what? A six pointed star behind him. And if you look at this, this is not a flying saucer. This is Saturn. This is the bottom of Saturn. These are the rings of Saturn. And this was the top of Saturn that has now opened up because this storm right here is a vortex. That's why down here you see these circles within circles. See how you're being, being brought up through the vortex? That through this six-pointed star, through the witchcraft and the sorcery and the occultism of this planet, this doorway right here opens up and allows you to ascend and evolve to a higher level. So as you can see, it's complicated, it's spiritual, it's metaphysical, it's supernatural, it's cosmological, it's hard to understand. Um, you know, in my opinion, I truly believe that there will come a point in humanity when these extraterrestrial entities are going to manifest in our, in our plane of existence, and they're going to be very real to us, and um, they're going to make the claims that they started everything on this planet. That, that concept was started by Watson and Crick, the two scientists who discovered the DNA molecule. And they coined that term, directed panspermia. And so um, it's not a coincidence that they're the ones who discovered the DNA molecule. Now, if you recall, Kenneth Grant was the successor of Aleister Crowley and he started something called Lamb Meditation. Remember, Aleister Crowley let Lamb into our time space through a portal that he opened up through a invocation ritual that he did in New York City in 1918. Um, this became so popular with all of the Crowleyan followers that Kenneth Grant started its own cult, the Cult of Lamb. It's known as lamb meditation. It's in referencing to entering the egg. Now, here's lamb over here. He's the three foot gray alien with a big head. And according to Kenneth Grant, you stare at lamb for a while. That's called the yantra of the cult. You continue to recite his name over and over and over. That's called the mantra. And when you get yourself into a hypnotic state, the union of the yanta and the mantra leads to the tantra. That's where you astral project out of your body. You enter into the egg of spirit through the head and the eyes of lamb. Um, transcendental meditation and mind altering drugs help with this process. And then once you've astral projected into his eyes, as we see here, uh, according to them, you then travel through this alien world. See here, when prompted, you enter the egg and you merge with that which is within and you look out through the entity's eyes on what appears to be an alien world or another dimension. And these people who've done this claim that this experience is very close to what people describe in alien abduction syndromes. And what's more interesting is he says that in order to achieve this, you have to perform the banishing ritual of the pentagram of Earth and record all experiences in detail, paying particular attention to the lunar phases, etc. So there's an entire process to achieve this, but it's clearly through witchcraft and sorcery, and it's more than just magic. Things are happening on a quantum level. Passageways and doorways are happening. Dimensional warping is occurring. The planets are being utilized and the fallen angels and the demonic powers are being drawn down. And this is allowing these people to, to travel in this astral world. You know, Kenneth Grant is the one who said that it is our aim to in, obtain insight into the nature of lamb and into the possibility of using the egg, that's the egg, as an astral space capsule for traveling and exploring extraterrestrial space. But they're really talking about traveling into interdimensional places.
other dimensions, higher dimensions. It's a spiritual phenomenon. Well, guys, I think this is a good place to stop. That's a lot of information to try and digest. Um, it's a, you know, the information is pretty wild, kind of mind boggling to understand it all. And, uh, I just want to take this time to say that, you know, the Bible is real. God is real. Jesus Christ is real. He's the son of God, the Messiah who came to take away the sins of the world. He's the lamb of God and the Holy Spirit is real. And so is this supernatural, sophisticated spirit of Antichrist. And that's the spirit that's dominating this world right now. And it's all going according to the plan. You know, the Almighty God, the Lord God, he's still sovereign over all. And the one in us is still greater than the one in the world. But there are dark times ahead. And there is a big deception that's being worked out as we speak. And I can't say when this is going to happen. I don't believe that it's too many years off. I don't believe that it's 50 years from now. I think that it could start happening tomorrow or it could be 5, 10, 20 years out. But as we continue to pay attention to world events, we're going to see more and more things come into alignment. They're going to continue to dole out all of the technology. They're going to continue to do the pro predictive programming on television. They're going to continue to do the, the police state and the surveillance. Eventually, there's going to be a global economic collapse. And at some point, they're going to roll out their one world currency. Meanwhile, they're going to be pushing their one world religion. And eventually, the mark of the beast is going to be issued. And the only way that any of us are going to be able to endure these things is by having a clean walk with the Lord and being fully sold out and surrendered to Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how big your bunker is, how many guns you have, how much gold or beans you've stored up, how smart you are, how in shape you are. None of those things are going to carry you through the level of deception that's coming on this earth. Because what we're dealing with is supernatural. It's above the, the, the order of nature. And it's during these last days when Psalm 91, the Psalm of protection, is going to become so imperative for each of us to wear that, that to put on the armor of God and, and to wear that. It says that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and I will trust him. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence that will come to the land. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. That's in reference to the angels. We are not to pray to angels, but it makes it clear that God sends his angels as messengers and ministers to minister over the elect. He will be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Although a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, it shall not come near to you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no plague shall come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, and they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. 
And I believe that is a euphemistic expression for all the the devils and the demons, the the lions and the serpents of the world. It says that Satan comes like a lion to kill, steal, and destroy, and and that we also know that Satan is Satan is referred to as a serpent. And so the Lord's going to give us power to tread over the serpent and the lion. The scripture goes on to say that for those whose love is set upon me, I will deliver them. I will set them on high because they know my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and I will show him my salvation. These are the promises of God, you know, and we have to we have to walk in those promises and we have to walk in the faith. And uh, that's what's going to carry us through. So on that note, Godspeed and we'll see you on the next one.